everything. The seat, the carpet, the lights, the buttons, the tables, um, the overhead bins, and it's really interesting. Like everything you see in this picture except the logo was, was done by my company. And it is incredibly complex stuff. Like making things at this scale and making things of this type is insane. And it's a world to which I had no access previously. We also do our own projects like building a bike. And so we designed a bicycle and now we're building 10,000 of them and we're going to start selling them soon. And that is also a scale and type of production to which I had no access previously, sitting around making little artsy things myself. Like, you know, this is me in my room at home. This is a factory in China. This is, it's been very interesting to, to get into that. We do things like build 3D printed headphone sets that you can download the files and build your own, and this is pitched as being something for the maker community. But I feel personally that that's kind of a propaganda move on our part because when we design something, it gets built here, and this is the reality. So we can show 3D printers, and we're playing with them, we're being cutesy designers, but it, this is where it really happens. Um, and, I, and like I'm saying, I, I appreciate deeply being given a front seat to this um, because I have learned something, and I have come to a realization to me, very important to me. Um, and that's that all of us are in a bed of a sort. We, this is that upon which we lay. These are the springs. We are the fish, and tech capitalism is the fish pole. This is what surrounds us. Um, and I have a proposition to make. Creative practices should engage their origins of materials. And that's classic, you know, materialist art proposition. Um, if you're going to use something in your creative practice, you should think about what it is. So if you borrow art imagery, think about ads and commerce. If you're going to work with steel, think about steel foundries and buildings. Um, you know, something creative and communicative and responsible in the world should think about, should think about the things which create it, which allow it to exist, the, its, its medium, if you will. And so for us, making things with code and electronics, I think, our creative practices should engage the should engage techno capitalism, the things that make our work possible, the people who build the things upon which our work runs, the the um, the ideas upon which most of our work is founded, like the, the fundament of what enables us to do things. We need to consider that relationship. All right. So a little interlude. I'm trying to tear apart art and design, and that may seem like kind of a, um, a stupid thing to do, trying to like tease them apart, but I think they're actually, it's interesting to see how similar they are to one another in, in all ways except one, which I want to point out. So they both have like this sort of iconic space. Um, so you know, you have an art gallery, it's this nice, cl nice clean white walls and wood floors, and you have a design studio, which is nice clean white walls and wooden floors. And you have the place of public celebration, and you have the place of public celebration, and you have the iconic mythic origins, and you have the iconic mythic origins, and you have the reality of making things, which is that very few, well, not very few, but lots of artists don't make their own stuff. Um, and that's not new, that's not something that's like a, you know, a recent development. Rembrandt actually had in contracts the number of brush strokes you can put in every painting because everybody knew that he didn't really paint most of his own paintings. Um, and design, despite our pretending otherwise, is not DIY, it's, that's craft. Design is like do it industrially. The, the idea of design blossomed during the Industrial Revolution. It really wasn't designed before that, it was just you were gonna make something so you made it, and suddenly you could have a factory make it, so you had a designer. Um, and also design has, or sorry, both art and design have a history that mirrors the political and social movements of the time. So, you know, there are, there are changes that you can see in the art and design that mirror the trends and anxieties, the advances of fabrication, chemistry, electronics, etc. These both shape art and design side by side. And I don't think this is accidental. Design really wants to be like art because art is allowed to have like a weird relationship with capitalism. Art objects aren't like, Art objects aren't bought and sold in the same way that most other objects are. They're not valued in the same way. The labor that goes into them is valued the same way. And the, um, the relationship that they have to larger economies, the institutions that support them, are, are 
I think, to the design world, um, enviable. Um, you can always, uh, you know, if, if you just need somebody to write some code, you can kind of like just get somebody who's going to do some code. If you need something built, you can get a machine, or you can get a factory, you can get a cheap pair of hands to do it. Um, but when you position design as something that's sort of this all-encompassing, weird way of making things more valuable and more magical and different than what their source materials actually are, that's something that you can't automate away. You can't just have that offshore or um, outsourced or you know automated away or you know. Uh, write a program to do that for you if it's something kind of intangible and magical and that infiltrates everything in making stuff. Um, so I, I think that it's on purpose that designers try to position design next to art. There's one big difference, and it's a really interesting difference, that art and capital and art and production have a very complex relationship. And design and capital and design and production is really, really simple. It, you know, you make it, you send it off, it gets made, that's, you know, whether it, it poisoned a river or if it was built by children or you know, whatever awful thing happened, like, you as the designer can be responsible for that, but you're not required to. That's not really in the ethos of design, especially industrial design, and especially design for manufacturing and production on scale. Okay, so that was a little, that was a little sidebar. Um, so I have a theory that a little while ago, design stopped meaning one thing, but it always means production and capital. It always means participating in capitalism. And I think this started in the 1980s with IDEO, and it became kind of a shorthand for any sort of structuring, user-centered activity. Um, but the thing is that like in hypercapitalism, that's everything. Like everything is purchasable and everything is a service and every interaction is some kind of economic transaction. And whenever you're shaping one of those things, you're designing. And so people can kind of pretend design isn't that, that it's something else. And I, that like, I love that Tim Brown wrote an article called Capitalism Needs Design Thinking, because that's sort of like saying that like air needs people to breathe it or that like, <laughs> the planet desperately needs things to live on it. Like, that is what makes design, that is what makes design possible. And I haven't said many things good about design culture, and I want to say a couple. Because <laughs> making commercial objects brings you into weird contact with production. And that's a valuable thing. Making one or two of something is very, very different than making a few hundred thousand of them. And how things are made is a really fascinating way to understand the world and understand human elements of the, the, the things, the objects that surround us, the people and the systems that are in place for it. Making commercial objects also brings you into weird contact with capital. So like a pure profit mode of reality is a very, very interesting place to visit. It's a strange thing to see, and it's, I think, just as relevant and just as important to understand as a purely religious value system is, or a purely insane value system, or anything that is external to your own value system, whatever that may be, to, to find something that feels a little external to it and that challenges it, I, I think is an interesting, um, it's an interesting place to force yourself into, to try to understand that and communicate with it. Um, and we are in very, very weird capitalism. I think that we, uh, if, I guess, if you, <laughs> if, you, if you take nothing else away from this talk, I guess we live in a world made out of innovation-centric activity. We, have a, we live and breathe in a world of very weird capital. And the question that I find myself pondering a lot is how we meaningfully communicate with that world that world of weird capital, that world of innovation-centric activity, and meaningfully being the operative word. Not just using its products, or taking its money, or buying its value systems, because we all kind of, in one way or another, in, in, um, in so many little ways as we do some advertising work, we do some design work, we're doing that, we can acknowledge it or not, um, that design, I think, offers a, an interesting path into a meaningful way of communicating with this strange activity that is going on around us. And there's a lot of different terms that get thrown around for design that is not playing by the traditional rules of design. 
And I like all of them, and I don't want to embrace any one of them, and I certainly don't want to make up my own new term. But I really love the idea of propositional design. I think the term proposition sounds right for something that is a future-looking investigation into what can be made. I think critical design is great because criticality is core to interrogating and understanding an underlying system, not taking things at pure face value. And I think fiction is a fantastically rich way of looking at making strange things for strange times. Um, we live in a life in, I like to say, perpetual anticipation of the next great thing because we're in the midst of a reinvention of our social bonds, of our value systems, of our economics, of how things get made, of the language that we speak, all these like mundane things in life. And we already kind of live in fiction because we live in promises made by a system that is not always entirely interested in the consequences of the decisions and artifacts that it's producing. And I think that's something that design does really well. I think design addresses the desire for the next great thing because that's what it's become. It's sort of a vague future promise. And interesting things happen when you get new tactics to speak with, when you get new tactics to understand, when you get new tactics to communicate. I think one of the challenges of trying to make strange things or to make propositions about how the future can be different is finding a language in which to do it. Um, and we're going to have to steal from things that communicate well with big systems if we want to engage how our own work is engendered by and participates in those big systems. Um, so I'm going to skip this slide really quick. But, so once upon a time, there was a thing called net art in the 90s. And I don't know who remembers Jody, but the network was the art. And that was a totally valid proposition. And it was an explosion of new kinds of creativity and new kinds of understandings of this hidden thing that was around us. It was a way to take it and turn it into something playful, but also something that unmasked it and something that made it um, both a possible world to explore and experiment with, um, but also a, um, a, like a, an avenue for critical expression. Um, so my question is, uh, why not, well I guess this is, like, the, you can take this idea of the network being the art and turn that same sentiment of taking an existing structure and an existing uh, means of communication and production and look at how product can be the same thing. So just a couple projects that I really personally like and one of my own slipped in there for context. Um, People Keeper is something by Lauren McCarthy and Kyle McDonald where she's looking at actually creating a device and an app that monitors your stress levels and emotional state, and then basically tells you who you should or should not be hanging out with. <laughs> and it is an art project, but it's pitched through this kind of cheery, better living through apps language of a startup that I think we're all familiar with. And, and I find this sort of like product as art really deeply meaningful because it's taking, it, it, it's helping us understand what the actual pitch is in IoT and app and monitoring yourself and this quantified life. And they do it like real. I mean, it looks real. And when it, something looks real, you have to treat it as real. And suddenly it stops existing just in the box of it being art. It looks like a thing that is out in the world and you have to wonder about what it means to actually have something tell you who you should or should not like. I worked on a project called The Bracket where you have an ankle bracelet that you wear on your ankle and you tell it how much money you make. <laughs> and when you walk into a um, census tract where your income is $10,000 more or less than the median income in that census tract, you get a slow, steady electrical shock. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's kind of, I mean, it's kind of cheeky, but it's also like, I, I'm, I'm extreme, like Seattle has the same things going on in San Francisco. We were watching neighborhoods change dramatically rapidly and people be both ecstatic about it and unhappy about it. Um, and I don't have anything deeper to say about this other than we all know we're uncomfortable about it and I don't know that anyone knows what to do about it. Um, even more vague and more weird and more fantastic and I think more, more rich um, 
is the idea of taking services, like these vague things that are beyond, like a device is a thing and it's got a battery and it's got a network that it connects to a service, not only is a thing and a device, but it is also the idea that there's an entire company behind it and pitching, um, pitching an art project this way, I, I think it asks you to consider not only what makes, not only what the thing does, but who makes it and who uses it and why they want it and how they continue to, to interact with it over time. So there's this project by Revital Cohen called Life Support, which is one of the reasons why I went to design school. Um, because I realized like making things could ask really large questions about, uh, about how we interact with, excuse me, the things around us that are alive, what our obligations to them are. Um, it changed how I thought about design. When someone said, here's my design project, it is a sheep that is a dialysis machi machine. And you plug into the sheep to clean your blood for you while you sleep. Or here is a dog that breathes for you. And to just like ask you to think deeply about your relationship to living things and the, the extensions to our own body with which we are very, very comfortable. And to think of those not only as just things, but like these are products that you can buy. In, imagine the world in which this is a product you can buy and this is a product that people live with and you go over to your friend's house and they're like, oh yeah, it's my breathing dog. And you're like, cool, all right, that's normal. Um, <laughs> there was another one from, this is also an RCA project, um, the Intel Cypress merger from Zoe Papadopoulou who just proposed that because Intel and Cyprus had about the same GDP, maybe they should just merge. Um, <laughs> and I think it takes national sovereignty and treats it like it's just another economic organization. It's just sort of a convenient social and economic thing that happens, you know, like a bunch of people get together. I mean, I'm simplifying this dramatically, but the, the idea of like corporation and, you know, nation being more or less like equivalent is, both really insane, and then in the era of Dubai and Qatar, maybe not all that insane. I mean, maybe it actually is just a fairly normal thing to propose, but she did it in this, like, she's got this video and she had all these promotional materials, like, welcome to Cyprus. You know, I can't remember who the chairman of Intel was at the time, but, you know, just sort of like, here's why you should do this. And she had all these graphs, and it was this very professional presentation, um, proposing, essentially, something that, asks us to reconsider what nationality and what boundary and border mean. Um, a more recent project is people making, is smell dating, where um, Tiga Brain is not only devising a service that is provocative and um, I think ticks all the boxes to be an art project, but she's also getting regular users for it. I would encourage you to go look at the website for Smell Dating because it has so many amazing videos of people's noses. <laughs> and they're just like devouring other people's clothing. So you get sent a bunch of clothes and you smell them all and you, you determine based on the smell of the clothes whether you want to meet that person or not. So instead of swiping through on Tinder, you're just having this really rich olfactory experience. Um, and I think it asks us to reconsider attraction and it asks us to reconsider the role that services and startups and apps and, and groups of people who are making money off of us play in our romantic lives. Um, and I think that's a really fascinating thing to ask us to think about. And you, you can ask someone to think about that or you can propose to someone a whole new mode of interaction which is strange strange enough to be considered deeply, but familiar enough that you can see yourself doing it. And I think that's what all of these projects, hopefully to you, um, feel like is something that is both at once very familiar and feels like a sensible, reasonable thing to do, and at the same time, foreign enough and strange enough that it reveals what lies underneath it. Um, so maybe the device is the art, or maybe the image of the startup around the device is the art, or maybe the society that embraces the device, or the service, or both, or even has the desire for this object is the art. Um, and those, to me, are deeply interesting arts, and that's an art that I really want. Um, I really want one that engages what it means to make things, 
or make not things or have weird economies or weird desires or weird interactions with the people and the objects around us that are mediated by systems that we may or may not be aware of or understand fully or participate in. Um, I naively or not, I, I deeply believe in the idea of an art that addresses that and makes it visible to us. Um, and so despite working at a very, very manufacturing oriented design firm that has given me a lot of very strange feelings about making things and factories and how production really works, I have seen in its, in its strategies for communicating with production and capital what I think are really rich lessons for making uh, things for creative practices that engage larger systems around us. Um, so with that, I will say the obligatory, this is where you can find me and I would be happy to talk to you in person or online about any of these things and thank you very much.